First up this morning, we've got Adam Wyland. Does anyone not know who Adam is? I mean, not that I can see. I think you all know who Adam is. Um, he's travelled a long way. He's travelled with his, uh, his partner and his daughter. He hasn't slept much for the last couple of days as a result. Um, so bear with him. But I think, I think you're really going to enjoy the talk. And uh, welcome Adam to the stage. Cool. So uh, my name's Adam Wyland. I'm a software developer from Canada. Thank you so much for inviting me to come down to Australia for the first ever Laracon AU. Give everyone a round of applause for making that for this one. It's awesome to be doing this. Uh, so today I'm going to speak about resisting complexity. So what am I even talking about? It's really just a generic talk title that I picked so I could talk about kind of whatever I wanted. So um, what we're going to talk about today is what I think is a fundamental misconception that I held about object-oriented programming for a long time that led me to write code that I think was unnecessarily complex and also less enjoyable to work on. So to get into it, I think it's best to start with a really ridiculous contrived example. So say we're working on a system where we needed to model watering plants for one reason or another. So we got this plant here that's just not living up to its full glory. It's clearly in desperate need of some hydration. So if we need to, to figure out how do we water this plant in code, how might we go about trying to model that and approach this? Uh, the approach that you know, I've, I've always taken up until some of the ideas that I want to talk about in this talk was I would think to myself, okay, well, we need to water a plant. Uh, what object can I create that can have the responsibility of watering plants? Like, what can water a plant? What has that ability? And I'd think about this for a little while, and then eventually I'd have that eureka moment. A gardener! A gardener can water a plant. This guy, he can water my plant. So how would I do this in code? Well, I might do something like this. I might create an instance of this new gardener class, and then I would use the gardener's watering ability, call the water method on the gardener, pass through the plant, and then with any luck, we have a beautiful, healthy plant as a result, right? So this is how I sort of approached solving problems and object orientation for a long time. I needed to do something. I tried to figure out what object can do the thing that I need to do, make the object that can have that ability, and then write the code. But I noticed over time, um, as I was paying more and more attention to the APIs of other objects out in the wild that I really enjoyed working with, either stuff from the standard library or stuff from different packages and stuff that I pulled in, that there was a, a little bit of a difference between how some of those worked versus how some of the code that I wrote worked. So let's look at an example and see if we can kind of figure out the difference here. So here's some JavaScript. We have an array of names, and we want to reverse that array. So we have names equals this array. We want to flip it around. We just call names.reverse, and now we have a reverse version of the array. Or similarly, we have a big string with a bunch of names that are kind of comma delimited, and we want to split that into an array. We just call the split method on the string, pass to the delimiter, we get back the array of names. Here's a PHP example. Uh, we have a date time object, and we want to format it to show what the day of the week representation is of that date. We just call the format method on the date, pass through the format string, and we get Thursday. So, Jumping back to our original example here, gardener, water, plant. If we wanted to sort of translate this into an English sentence, like a human readable form, we might say something like, what we're saying here is that a gardener can water a plant, right? And if we were to sort of generalize this, we'd end up with a structure like when you have an object with a method that takes some parameters, you're saying that that object can method those parameters. It's something that the object is doing to the parameters. So let's take a look at the examples that we were looking at from some of those other APIs and see how they stack up using this sentence structure. So we have an array can reverse. Okay, it doesn't seem too unreasonable. Maybe a little bit grammatically awkward, but not too bad. What about this one? A string can split a delimiter. What? <laughs> that's not right. It's not the string that's splitting the delimiter, right? It's not like the string is a string splitter that takes another string and splits it. What we're actually saying is that a string can be split using a delimiter. We are the ones splitting the string by calling the split method on the string, and we're giving it any additional information it needs to do the split correctly. So it's a little bit different. So if we try to generalize this format, we end up with something like this. An object can be method using parameters. 
So what this led me to realize is that using that structure, we're sort of treating methods as affordances uh, rather than abilities. So what's an affordance? So affordance is a term that I first learned in Donald Norman's uh, book, The Design of Everyday Things. And his definition of affordance is basically a feature or property of a thing that helps you understand what you can do with it. So for example, here we have like a chest of drawers, right? And the drawers have handles on them. The handle is an affordance that the drawer is affording you, saying that it can be pulled. Um, if there was no handle there, you wouldn't really know how you're supposed to open the drawer. Do you like push it and it pops out or something? The handle is telling you you can pull it to open it. So when we talk about methods on objects as affordances, we're thinking about methods as being the object's way of telling you what you can do with the object, rather than it being a list of abilities that the object has, like things it can do to other things. So looking at this uh, example again, let's run it through some of the examples we looked at before and make sure that this sort of format stacks up. So here's the original one. A string can be split using a delimiter. That makes sense. An array can be reversed. Perfect. That makes sense. A date can be formatted using a date string. Perfect. And maybe a little bit more controversially, a user can be saved. <laughs> How many times have you heard that argument about active record versus data mapper where everybody is like, a user can't save itself. It's not a database saver thing. It's just a user. You need something else to do the saving. <laughs> right? But that's like a straw man argument, because that's not what methods are. Methods are things that you can do with an object. If an active record model or an eloquent model represents a database record, then the only things I really expect to be able to do with it are update it, save it, delete it. If those were the only methods that it had, that would make perfect sense. So let's take a look at our gardener example again. Using this sentence structure, having gardener water plant, we end up with a gardener can be watered using a plant. <laughs> Maybe this makes sense if you're building a game like Revenge of the Plants or something, and the plants have to get back at the evil gardener. But for what we're working on, I don't think this is the, the right way to model this. So what we really want to say, right? Oh, I, I should miss an opportunity to use this GIF again. Let's just. <laughs> thanks to Keith Damiani from Titan for making this GIF for me. <laughs> um, but yeah, so a gardener can be watered using a plant. This isn't, this isn't right, right? What's more correct using our original or our new sentence structure is that a plant can be watered. The interesting thing is there's no gardener involved anymore, right? Us as the programmer becomes the gardener. <laughs> so instead of gardener, new gardener, water plant, whoa, we got a little jumpiness going on there. I was warned that this can happen with this remote. So new gardener, gardener, water plant, this is no good. All we really need is plant, water, done, the end. So the whole gardener thing kind of goes away. So um, for the rest of the talk, I want to walk through some examples from a real world code base that sort of demonstrate how this sort of thinking can help you simplify uh, some of your code. So the first way that this can help you simplify your code is by eliminating agent nouns. So what is an agent noun? An agent noun is an awesome term that I discovered on the internet that perfectly describes what I wanted to talk about. So I was very glad that it existed. Uh, so basically an agent noun is a noun denoting someone or something that performs the action of a verb, typically ending in er, right? So uh, driver might be the agent noun for drive, or worker might be the agent noun for work, or splitter might be the agent noun for split. So let's look at some real code and not look at slides anymore, because that's boring, and um, look at how we can sort of apply some of this stuff. OK, so here I've got this code base that's sort of um, a stripped down version of uh, my personal course platform. So for anyone who's not super familiar with me, um, I make my living online creating courses. Like I did a course on test driven development with Laravel, and an advanced view course, and I sell them online. And I have a platform that I've put together for people to kind of create accounts and log in and watch the lessons and stuff like that. So this is all code from there. So one of the things that you can do in that application is whenever I need to sort of send some information to people who have bought the courses, like maybe, hey, some new lessons have been published or something, I want to be able to broadcast an announcement to all the relevant users. So here's an example of how I might have written the code to broadcast an announcement using the sort of methods as abilities mindset. So we have this announcements controller. 
Uh, we have a store method, which is going to get hit whenever we actually try to create the new announcement. And this takes an announcement broadcaster as a dependency. So we do some validation. Uh, we create the new announcement, which is just an eloquent model. And then we use the announcement broadcaster to broadcast that announcement. Um, so again, this is kind of how I used to think about modeling stuff. And it made perfect sense to me at the time. But using this sort of flipped around approach, this doesn't really make sense anymore. Um, here, we're basically saying an announcement can be, or sorry, an announcement broadcaster can be broadcast using an announcement, right? That doesn't make any sense. So if we wanted to try and simplify this and treat broadcast as an affordance of the announcement, we might try to write something like this instead, right? Announcement broadcast, and that would kind of be it. So let's take a look at how we can actually make this work and what some of the changes involved would be and some of the trade-offs and stuff that we have to make to make it work. So let's just pull up the announcement broadcaster for a second. You can see it takes a dispatcher, which is just the queue dispatcher as a dependency, and to broadcast the announcement, it updates a timestamp on the announcement and then queues up a job to actually send all those emails out to people. So let's copy this broadcast implementation and try and move it over to the actual announcement class instead. So you can see this announcement eloquent model actually doesn't have any behavior at all right now. It's not responsible for anything other than being a database record, which to me is kind of a smell. Like objects should have some meaning, some behavior they're supposed to perform. So if we're going to try to move this over here, um, all of a sudden broadcast doesn't actually take an argument anymore, right? Like we can see we're just calling broadcast directly on the announcement, done deal. So we don't need this parameter. And now here where we're referencing the announcement, this just becomes this. And this is kind of uh, interesting and leads me to another point. So let's just jump back to the slides for just a second just so we can look at another exciting title slide. Uh, one of the things that using this approach helps you do is it helps promote encapsulation. So the idea of encapsulation is that objects should control access to their fields, right? And other things in the system shouldn't just willy-nilly be updating fields in objects. Using our previous implementation, the announcement broadcaster was directly changing this field on the announcement. But using this implementation, where the broadcast method lives on the announcement, the announcement itself is sort of in control of updating this broadcast at field. So that doesn't sort of leak outside of this object. So uh, the next thing that we can do here is where we're actually dispatching this job, passing through the announcement. That's just going to be this now, because we're inside the announcement. But the tricky part right, is here, with this dispatcher. So this is the actual queue dispatcher for dispatching the job. How do we get this queue dispatcher into this eloquent model? Uh, we can't pass it in through the constructor or anything, right? Because the constructor is reserved for sort of the, the fields that we want to create it from. So how are we going to make this work? Well, one way that we could do it is using like a facade, right? Like using service location. So we could just say something like queue dispatch and be done. Now, I used to see code like this or think about writing code like this and be very disappointed with myself. You know, I would think, oh, this is so sad. I'm resorting to using service location and accessing a global container from inside of my models. Like the purity of my code has been compromised, right? It's, it's sort of disappointing. But um, recently I've sort of changed my mind on this a little bit. So let's spend a second talking about maybe why. So conquering your fear of facades or really your fear of service location. So a lot of the complaints about facades, most of us probably know are not totally valid. Things like, oh, you can't test code that uses facades, stuff like that. That stuff is quantifiably provable that you can still test code that uses facades. You just swap out implementations in the container and you're done. The real complaint that I think people have is they don't like feeling like they're coupling their code to some global thing that exists. Right? They, they feel like that's binding yourself to the framework in sort of gross ways. But the thing is, in PHP, we actually depend on global stuff, uh, maybe a lot more than, than you might realize uh, in situations where no one really sweats it. So for example, uh, the date time API. So you can create a new date time passing through you know, the time and the time zone. You can format it and spit out the representation of that. You can set the time zone to something else, format it again, and spit out the new representation based on that new time zone. So I think what a lot of people don't do when they look at this code is think about like how does this actually work? How does the date object know how to convert between time zones and stuff? And the way that it does it is using this global time zone database that's installed with PHP that you can update using Peckle and stuff like that. Um, so this date time object is like reaching out to this global dependency to get all that information. 
Now, normally the, the issue with doing something like that is that you can't have like multiple implementations at runtime, right? So say you were building an application where for whatever reason, you needed to use multiple time zone databases depending on some criteria. PHP's built-in daytime stuff would not help you there. There's no way to say, oh, now use this time zone database, so now use this one. You can't just inject different time zone databases. But no one's ever complained about that because it doesn't matter. No one's ever needed to do that, so it's fine. So using something like a queue dispatcher through a facade globally is, is not that different. If you only have one queue dispatcher per environment, right, so it's configured with different credentials in development and production or whatever, you can sort of safely treat it as a, a global thing and it's not actually that bad because the ergonomics of being able to just use it when you need it, just like the time, daytime thing, uh, can be helpful and it's like a, a worthwhile trade-off to consider when you're designing stuff. Now, I know I'm not gonna convince everybody that this is okay, so let's talk about an alternative solution. So, um, something that not everybody maybe realizes is that in programming languages like PHP that have these things called functions or methods, a feature of methods and functions is that they can actually accept parameters. For example, this broadcast method could ex accept a dispatcher as an argument. And down here, instead of using the facade, we could just use the dispatcher. Now back in the controller, what this would look like is maybe instead of accepting the announcement broadcaster as a dependency here, we would just accept the dispatcher, and we won't type in it here just for brevity's sake. And then down here, we could just pass that through, just sort of thread it through as a dependency. And now this is totally swappable whenever you need to swap it out, and you're not relying on service location, and you also didn't need to create some other object to be responsible for this stuff. Uh, that said, personally, I probably wouldn't do it that way. I would just use service location because I think it's fine. And I would probably write it a little bit different. Um, in more recent versions of Laravel, you can do stuff like this, where you can just dispatch a job directly, and this will use service location under the hood to basically do the same thing. But that's kind of how I would handle that. Cool. All right, so that means that this like announcement broadcaster class can totally get deleted, and we actually don't even need a constructor for this controller anymore. So we've completely eliminated an object from our system by just deciding, oh, you know what, like, the fact that an announcement can be broadcast, it actually makes sense that that method lives on the thing that's being broadcast rather than having to create a new object just for that thing. Uh, let's look at one more example of an agent noun sort of problem, a more insidious one. So let's open up this product purchases controller. So this is sort of where, where the actual purchasing of stuff um, happens. So you can see that this controller takes a purchase fulfillment service and a payment gateway as dependencies. And when someone actually tries to purchase, what happens is we validate some information about the request, uh, and then we charge them. We create a new purchase object with information from the successful charge. And then we use the purchase fulfillment service to fulfill that purchase, which might include generating licenses for that user, uh, sending them emails, with access links, maybe adding them as a collaborator to a GitHub repository, stuff like that. So this purchase fulfillment service is the sneaky agent noun that I want to eliminate here. So when we look at this purchase fulfillment service, most of us probably know that, that what this really is, it's just a purchase fulfiller, right? But we didn't want to call it that because we all knew that that was a really stupid class name. <laughs> So we just change it to purchase fulfillment service, we feel better about it, and we're done. But really this is just the same thing that we we're looking at before. So if we're trying to cut, sort of refactor this to kind of put methods with the things that they're operating on, we might want to write this something like purchase fulfill instead, right? So let's quickly refactor this code to work that way. So let's head over to the purchase fulfillment service and take a look at what it's doing. So it takes a mailer, and then when it fulfills the purchase, it just creates some licenses and then sends an email to the user. So let's grab this implementation, and we'll move it over to the actual purchase class and uh, figure out what we need to do to get it working. All right, so copy and paste it a little bit too much, but that's no big deal. Text editors are powerful things. Okay, so 
uh, let's take a look at what we need to change. So first things first, any reference to purchase just becomes this, right? So how many do we got here? I think it's just these ones. So this is again sort of promoting encapsulation in a sense, right? We're not accessing fields directly from outside of the object. We're trying to constrain access to be within the object. Uh, but the thing that isn't really gonna work here is where we're sending that email, right? So there's a couple ways that we could handle this. Basically what we already talked about. We could either use the facade, right? So we could say like mail to. Uh, we could pass in the mailer directly to this method from the controller. Or another approach uh, that can work well in a lot of cases like this is to look at this mailing stuff as just like ancillary work that's not really the core flow of what we're trying to do and push that somewhere else. So something I like to do a lot of the time to try and limit the complexity of what's happening inside my eloquent models is to push side work like this to event listeners when I can. So um, let's take a look at what that might look like. So maybe what we do is we do something like we dispatch an event, like a purchase fulfilled event. And we pass through the purchase, because this is the purchase that was fulfilled. And now we just have to set up a listener to sort of handle this mailing stuff for us. So I'm sure most of us have worked with event listeners before, but there's one kind of interesting thing that I want to talk about related to them um, that I think is a helpful thing to keep in mind. A lot of time I see people creating event listeners, but sort of naming them after the event that's being listened for. So you might do something like PHP artisan make listener purchase fulfilled listener. I don't think this is a good way to name uh, event listeners. I think a better approach is to name them based on the actual action that they're, that they're gonna take, sort of naming them more like functions. So I might make an event listener called send uh, purchase fulfilled email. So it's named like a function, not like after the event that it's listening for. So if we make a listener like this, you know, we can head over to the send purchase fulfilled email listener. And now this could actually accept the mailer as a dependency since this is resolved out of the container anyways. And then in the handle method, we just use that mailer. Anywhere where we're referencing this, that's gonna become event purchase to grab the purchase off the event that was dispatched and just kind of do that stuff. And, and we're kind of good to go. And that simplifies this code a little bit now, right? So now we've got another class that we were able to delete, which is this purchase fulfillment service. It just kind of goes away. So that's another place that these like agent nouns can sort of show up in your code, is when you have things ending in service that maybe just have one method on them that's named suspiciously like the actual class name, um, you could have a situation where a method might be in the wrong place. All right, let's take a look at some more examples. Okay, so here's another thing that thinking about methods this way can help you do, uh, breaking up God objects. So a God object in a system is sort of one of maybe several objects that seems to attract a lot of behavior. Um, in my experience, the one that attracts the most behavior tends to be user. You end up with a lot of methods on user because when you're thinking about methods as abilities, User seems like the logical place to put a lot of stuff because the user is the only thing in your system that is like a sentient being that can actually do things, right? So let's take a look at what um, this might look like as an example and what we can do to kind of clean it up. So here's another controller, a license redemptions controller. So when someone has a, an access link to, to view a course, uh, they have to redeem that license associated with that link and sort of connect it to their account. So the line that we're interested in here is where we're grabbing the current user and we're using the redeem license method on the user to say this user wants to redeem this license. If we think about that sentence structure stuff we talked about before, uh, this ends up being kind of incorrect, right? Here we're saying like a user can be redeem licensed using a license, <laughs> like it doesn't make any sense. So a more logical way to write this might be license redeem since the license is the thing that we're actually trying to act on and then the user is just some data that we need that's part of redeeming that license. So let's take a look at how we might move this method over to the license and kind of make the user less of a God object. So if we open up user, we can see here there's this, the redeem license method. There's nothing to it really. It just updates the user ID for the license and then dispatches an event. So anything else in the system that needs to do anything in response to this happening can do that. So let's just cut that out and head over to the license class and uh, we'll add this method in. So instead of redeem license now, it's just gonna be redeem, and it's gonna take a user instead of a license. 
And now here we're promoting encapsulation again, right? Instead of the user updating the licenses fields, the license is updating its own fields uh, just using the user's uh, primary key. And then we're dispatching an event using this instead of license. And now here in this controller, that's one less method that lives on the user and it gives the license object a real purpose because prior to this, it didn't actually have anything except a bunch of scopes and relationships and stuff. This is the only like real behavior that it actually has. A license can be redeemed. Okay, let's take a look at uh, either one or two more examples here. Okay, uncovering new concepts. So this was actually kind of interesting. So, so far up until now, every time that we've tried to do one of these refactorings, we've just been taking a method from like a service class or something and moving it to an object that we already have. Um, but a lot of the time you don't always have the object that you need and you have to kind of figure out how to model it differently and bring this new object into existence. But thinking about it from an affordances mindset, I think you tend to create different objects. So let's take a look at an example. So we head back to the product purchases controller. This is where we were doing the purchase fulfillment service refactoring. Um, I like to think of controllers as having kind of four pieces to them, right? There's fetching the data related to the request, which here we're doing with route model binding. Then there's sort of validating the request. Then there's doing the thing that the controller is supposed to do. And then there's like returning a response back to the user. So in this case, the doing the thing that the controller is supposed to do section is pretty beefy. And um, if you're trying to keep this slimmed down, especially as maybe this gets more complicated as you introduce coupon handling or some other features related to purchasing, it might be nice to figure out how can we extract this behavior into another object that's a little bit smaller that we can just sort of look at on its own instead of just dealing with this big old controller method. So you have to try and think, like if we're thinking of methods as affordances, what is the object that we're trying to do something to to actually sort of handle this purchase, right? You might think that, okay, this request is coming in, someone's trying to make a purchase. Um, maybe what we're doing here is we're charging them and all that stuff, and, and that's like completing the purchase. They sort of initiated the purchase, and all this stuff, the stuff related to charging them, creating the object, that's like the process of completing the purchase. So you may think maybe we can do something like purchase, complete, and maybe this has some parameters or something we don't know yet, right? But the problem with this is the purchase doesn't actually exist yet because the purchase is sort of an artifact of the purchase being completed. So we have to sort of think about some other terms. So what might we call a purchase before it's actually done? Uh, the term that I landed on that I like in this particular case is checkout. We have this instance of a checkout. A user is sort of going through the checkout process and we're completing that checkout instance to end up with a purchase. So let's look at how we might use that sort of metaphor to write this code. So maybe we do something like checkout equals new checkout, and then we have to think about what arguments does the checkout take, right? Well, if an object is mostly about sort of controlling access to its fields and the data that it's encapsulating, I think the, the most important things here are probably the product that the person is trying to purchase, and then the person who's trying to purchase that product, which is just represented by the email in this case. So maybe we can do something like product, and then request email, and this is sort of the, the building blocks of the checkout. And then to complete the checkout, maybe this is where we do the actual payment stuff. So we could just use like service location to access the payment gateway inside the checkout, but I can certainly see a world where maybe we wanna support multiple payment gateways and switch on them at runtime depending on what page the person's coming from or something, right? Maybe PayPal or Braintree or Stripe, whatever. So in this case, I think it's uh, pretty easy to make the argument for passing this through as an argument to the complete method. And then we also need the payment token that's being used. And those are kind of the only inputs to this whole thing. So if we pass that stuff through, so we have this checkout that we created, we complete the checkout. We need to get a purchase back to return to the user. So maybe completing the checkout is what ultimately creates uh, this purchase for us. So let's take a look at actually making this work quickly here. Um, so let's create this checkout object. So here's how I create any class in Laravel all the time, even classes that are not eloquent models. <laughs> PHP artisan make model checkout because it's the fastest way for me to get a file in the right directory with the right namespace and all that stuff. So I'll just grab this uh, checkout class, we'll delete everything that makes it an eloquent model because it's not. And uh, let's just try and get this working. So we'll add a constructor 
uh, that takes the products and also takes the email of the person who's trying to do the checking out. And then let's give it a complete method. And this takes a payment gateway and a payment token. And let's grab the implementation from here. So these are kind of the three steps. We charge them, we create the purchase, then we fulfill the purchase. So let's just grab all this stuff and kind of paste it in here and rework a couple things. So this payment gateway, this is not instant state on the checkout now anymore. A payment gateway just gets passed through as an argument. So we can replace this payment gateway. I think there's only one of them with just payment gateway. A request payment token, that's just gonna come in directly as an argument now. Request email, there's a couple references to this, and this is gonna be instance state now, right? Because we pass this in through the constructor. And then, aside from that, I think we're good. We just need to return this purchase when we're done. Uh, so now, in theory, right, we can delete this code, and we've created a sort of refactored version of this where we discovered this new concept in our system, this idea of a checkout, but I don't think we ever would have created an object for this if we were thinking the other way, where we were thinking, okay, well, what can handle a person's checkout? We might make like a purchasing service or something, you know what I mean? Uh, but by thinking, okay, well, what is the user trying to do? They're trying to complete their purchase. Well, we need to figure out what is the object that we're trying to do that method to. And it, it, just, it just helps you find different objects than you would have found if you were thinking about it the other way around, which I think is kind of an interesting thought experiment. Okay, I think we got uh, one more thing to look at here. Okay, so maybe you just need a function. So what do I mean by this? So there are certainly situa situations where just moving a method to the object that it's operating on doesn't end up working for a variety of reasons. Uh, one example of that is related to testing. So let's take a look at our purchase class for a second. I'm gonna pull up a test for this, the purchase test here. And you can see I've just got a simplified test kind of showing that once we have an instance of a purchase, when we fulfill it, that a license was created for that purchase and that the license has the appropriate license code. If we go and try to run this though, you can see we have a problem. We're expecting the license code to be ABC123, but it's actually blah, 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 blah right? So <laughs> that's no good. So let's take a look at the code and figure out, well, how can we sort of stub out what the generated license is gonna be? How can we sort of control that in our tests? If we actually look at the implementation, all we're doing is like a string random 32 character thing. It's not unique, but it's unique enough for this talk. <laughs> um, so, you know, how can we force this to return a specific value? There's not really any way for, for us to do that using this implementation. So, this is where you might find yourself wanting to do something like, okay, we need to make a new object responsible for generating license codes so we can swap out the implementation of the container with a stub or a fake. And you might want to do something like app license code generator class and then call you know, the generate license code method on it, right? I don't know about you, but I've written code like this so many times where I have this class where the class name and the method name are like exactly the same. And I'm starting to see this as a smell more and more as time goes on. So the silly thing about this is that we don't actually need a whole object for this, right? Like we don't need like multiple generators doing multiple things. Like all we're really trying to do is swap out some little bit of code that runs with another little bit of code that runs. What we really want is a replaceable generate license code function, not a whole class or a whole service or agent noun for this sort of thing, right? So Something that's interesting about like the container in Laravel is there's nothing stopping us from just resolving a string out of it, like generate license code. And this can return a function, not like a, a, an object or anything fancy like that, and we can just invoke it. So if we head over to our test now, uh, at the beginning of our test, we could do something like this app instance generate license code, and we can just replace this with a closure that just returns ABC123. Now if we did this right, this should actually get us green, yeah. So that lets us sort of stub out what function is being used to do that. All we're basically trying to do is take some little piece of code and say, we need this to be swappable through the container. So we're gonna resolve that little bit of code out of the container and we're just resolving a function is perfect for doing that. 
Now, personally, and maybe some of you might agree with me, when I look at this, where we're just like resolving a string, just arbitrary global function out of there, uh, it makes me feel a little bit uncomfortable. It feels like kind of unorganized. It feels like, okay, now I need to have like some functions.php file, hello 2005. Um, and then in my composer.json file, I need to like auto load some, you know, that file. And you just have to make changes that are kind of, kind of gross. Um, but PHP has this idea of invocable classes too, where you can sort of use a class to represent a function. So that's a trick that I like to use in these sort of situations a lot, is I'll do something like generate license code, which is again, just the name of the function. We're not naming it like a noun, we're naming it like an action. Resolve that out of the container. And then same thing in the test. We're gonna replace the generate license code invocable class with a closure. So uh, take a step back here. Let's actually generate this uh, class and look at it so we can kind of make sure that we're all on the same page here. But we can do something like artisan make model, of course. <laughs> generate license code. And if we pull this up, get rid of this stuff. Now all we need to do is add a method called invoke. And this will let us use instances of this object's like functions, basically. Um, so here we can return the original implementation, the stir random 32 thing. Then if we make sure that this is imported in both of these places, and then like if we didn't make any mistakes, this should still run and pass, and it does. Um, so that's kind of like a neat way to take, like, okay, so you might look at this and you might think, this is not any different than having a license code generator, right? And it's really not. All we've done is change the name of the class and change the name of the function that we're calling. But I think from a communications perspective, it's a lot better. Um, we're being honest about the fact that this is just a function. It's not like a thing. Um, and naming it that way, I think, gives you a little bit more freedom in how you're doing this stuff. Like if you know all I wanna make is a function, you don't have to think about like, what is the noun, the manager, the service, the whatever that's gonna handle this. You don't have to jump through all those hoops. You just admit to yourself, all I want is a function. I'm making it a class because that makes it easier to namespace and auto load and stuff like that. It's just a function wrapped up in a class, it's, it's fine. Um, yeah, so those are, those are all the examples that I, I think I need to get through. So the, the thing that I wanna leave you guys with, I guess, is that if you wanna think about object orientation this way, and I encourage you to do so because I think it leads to code that is simpler and you're writing less useless objects that don't really deserve to exist. Um, you should think about these agent noun classes, these classes that end in er or service and stuff like that as sort of a last resort. It doesn't mean you'll never need them. There's probably a lot of situations that you're gonna run into where it's like, I've evaluated all the options, this one is the nicest. Um, but I think what I used to do up until I sort of started thinking about things this way is this was kind of like my first option. Anytime I needed to solve a problem, I think, what new object can I create that can have this responsibility and I would put stuff in it. And I would just create more and more classes that didn't need to exist because it turns out I already had the objects where those methods really belonged. So uh, what I encourage you to do is look for ways to use the classes that are already in your system to model the behavior that you need to model and only create these sorts of doer classes and stuff when you have exhausted all the other options and know for sure this is uh, the better solution. So that's all I have. Uh, thanks, I'm Adam Wathen on Twitter, and that's my website. Yeah.